episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Uh, welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with another truly fascinating guest who is helping create a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, we have the honor today of being joined uh, by Colonel Dr. Jeffrey Ling, uh, who is founder and chief executive officer of On Demand Pharmaceuticals, which is a, a fascinating uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing company that's creating the world's first distributed and reconfigurable medicine production system uh, to enable rapid response uh, in areas where conditions are uncertain and changing. And ultimately their mission is to provide adequate, safe and reliable supplies of medicines to any community across the world when it's needed. Uh, in addition to his role as CEO at On Demand Pharmaceuticals, Dr. Ling is an attending neurointensive care physician and a professor of neurology at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he is director of the Neurotrauma Laboratory and founder of the Center for Military Clinical Neurosciences at the Uniformed Services University of Health Science. He is also the former founding director of the Biologic Technology Office at DARPA, uh, in addition to all that, uh, he is the Vice Chair of Research in the Department of Clinical Neurosciences at Innova Fairfax Medical Center in Fairfax, Virginia, where he provides leadership for the research programs in neurosurgery, neurology, and physical medicine rehab. Uh, Dr. Ling earned his PhD in pharmacology at Cornell University Graduate School of Medical Sciences and his MD at Georgetown University School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Jeff Ling, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come talk to us. No, it is my honor, Ira. I'm very pleased to be here. Great to see you. Great to see you. Um, Jeff, typically, you know, we start things off by handing our guests the floor uh, for a little bit just to talk about themselves. Um, if you could just uh, take us into for a few minutes into an introduction to, to Dr. Jeffrey Ling, uh, a little bit of your backgrounds or where you grew up, how you got interested in, in medicine and pharmacology, uh, obviously uh, your military career. I, I think this would be a great way to sort of lay the backgrounds what we're going to be talking about. No, absolutely. Glad to do it. Thank you. Um, you know, life, uh, now that I've gotten old and ugly, um, life is uh, kind of like a river, you know, and you're on this raft and you kind of like drift on this river. You think you're going to a spot, especially when you're young. You're absolutely convinced that you're going to be at a certain spot at a certain time. And you find that the river has its own way of meandering you down this path. So uh, I think that's true for all of us. So, I mean, I grew up uh, in New York City. I was a typical public school kid. I, you know, I went to the schools that had the numbers, you know. And, um, and then uh, after college, you know, I decided I wanted to be a scientist. That, that's ultimately what I wanted to be. And that's how I ended up at Cornell. Uh, and I wanted to basically invent uh, new kinds of medicines for people. And that's how I ended up in pharmacology, which you know is a discipline that both studies the, um, the science of drugs. Uh, pharmacists are medical professionals who dispense drugs. Pharmacologists are scientists uh, who toil away in a laboratory. So I, I would decide to become a lab person. And, I was, and it was at that time at Cornell, where my eyes opened up to the possibilities of what you can do with medicines. But I was there really to invent new medicines. That was, that was my, my goal. And uh, when, I, when I got out of Cornell, I, I, I went across the street to Sloan Kettering, where I you know, did some more advanced uh, uh, research in that same field of trying to come up with new painkillers. That was my goal at the time, was coming up with a non-addictive uh, painkiller. And this, of course, in the 80s, right? So 1980s uh, for some of your audience who doesn't even don't even know what that means. So um, ultimately, um, it was there that I decided that uh, it was time also to go into medicine. And so I decided to, uh, at that point, pivot a little bit and add to that knowledge base I had learned on how to study drugs, how to invent new drugs and that sort of thing to actually developing medical training so that I could understand the application of those drugs. So that was my intent. You know, I, mean, I, I wasn't anything loftier than that. I still wanted to stay and be a scientist. But this is where life takes over. You know, I didn't, I didn't have enough money to go to, uh, to medical school, to be honest with you. I, was, I, was, I, was, I, I had a humble background, just like all of us on the line did. And so I needed to have a rich uncle that would pay for med school. And, um, and my rich uncle was Uncle Sam. And so Uncle Sam um, decided that uh, he would let me go to med school if I'd come and work on his farm when I got done. And his farm, of course, was the United States Army. And, and so I, I signed up for the Army to pay for med school. I'll be very blunt. It wasn't, I wasn't a flag waver or you know, anything like that. Didn't come from you know, a tradition of um, you know, military service or anything like that. But I said that that's okay. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a fair deal at the time. I, I was poor and I wanted to go to med school. So here we go. Uh, Jeff goes to med school. And um, 
And then, and I joined the army at the same time. And the army left me alone until I got done. When I got done with med school, they said, come on down. Time to, time to pay back. And, you know, next, and the reality hits you that, oh my gosh, I'm going in the, in the army. The army was great. The thing that struck me about the army, which really helped at that time, this is what I mean by this river that carries you down. The army, the people you meet in, the, in, the, in military service are there to serve. You know, they end up for a lot of different reasons, but they end up staying because they want to serve. And that was really a remarkable thing. Uh, you know, it's a volunteer army, so nobody's coerced to go in. You're not drafted. They're like me. They end up for any number of reasons. But when you meet them, I really found that there was a sense of duty, a sense of pride, you know, a sense of, of service, right? Um, nobody talks about how much money they're going to make because if, if they are, they're, they're in the wrong place. But they do talk about the things that they're going to do. And this will come back to you later uh, in, in my story. But, uh, and so while I was in the service, I realized that this was a remarkable time and a remarkable place. But, you know, I, I paid back my debt. I fulfilled my obligation. And, you know, I was at the Walter Reed and I did all the medicine stuff and I even set up a lab and do research. And then it was time to get out. And I was looking to uh, separate from the service. And I actually took a job at a very prominent university. And, um, and I sold my house in expectation to move uh, from D.C. to this other uh, location. And 9-11. 9-11. Uh, so I had taken the job in August. I put the house on the market. And then September came. And then at that point was a galvanizing moment. I could not leave the service. This country was attacked. I was in the army and I was not about to leave the army when the United States was under attack. It's, this is a life moment. Yep. And so I, um, I went to my, uh, my commanding officer and I said, uh, I'd like to pull back my separation papers, we call them. And I called the place that I was going to go and I explained to them that uh, I can't leave. And they, everybody understood and I stayed in the army. And the army, uh, because we were, at, we, we were going to war, there's no question about it. And I was in a place that I could serve. And so then, um, and, and the rest is history. I ended up, as you know, being deployed to Afghanistan in 2003. I came home, I joined DARPA, which was a remarkable experience. It was life-changing for me. Went back to Iraq in 2005 uh, as a doctor. And then uh, a few more missions, all at the same time, I was a DARPA program manager, then a DARPA direct, uh, office director, and blah, blah, blah. And everything came together. And suddenly, my life took on a different meaning. It just took on a different meaning is that I was in an opportunity, in a place, the Army and DARPA and the medical service, where we could actually uh, perform service. And I'll tell you this one little vignette that brings it to home. Please. And this was when I was in Iraq in 2005. And, um, and there was, a, oh, the, the country was exploding. I mean, there was all this, this unbelievable amount of, uh, of gunfire going on. And, and, and we were a very busy Trump service. One night, I, got, I, I went down to the triage area where all the wounded come in. And I ran across this young fellow who was, um, um, he was, he was in, um, he was a, what they call a, um, a turret gunner. He was actually the machine gunner that sits in the turret of a Humvee. And they were driving on Baghdad. They hit an IED. It blew up. It pitched him out of the top of the, uh, of, of the turret there. He landed on his back and broke his back in three places. And so we ended up coming to the hospital. Uh, we were at the combat support hospital in that region. And I was, went down to see him and I saw him and um, I examined him and he did not have a spinal cord injury, which was like great, right? Mm -hmm. But he did have broken bones uh, in his spinal bones as it were. And so I told him, I said, I said, um, I said hey, uh, son, you've got uh, a million dollar injury. Uh, and a million dollar injury is left over from World War II is where you're hurt enough that you get sent home but not hurt bad enough that it leaves you with a permanent disability. He had a broken bone, but it'll heal and no spinal cord injury. So it won't be a permanent injury. So I said, son, you got a, you got a million dollar injury, man. I'm going to send you home. And he starts to cry. He grabs me and he says, Colonel, do not send me home. And that, that totally blew my mind. And I said to him, I said, why? I said, you, you have a, You have a million dollar injury. You're going to go home. You're going to get patched up. You're going to be walking again. You're not no disability. And you're going to get a purple heart. I mean, you're going to get a legitimate purple heart. You, you got this injury in, while you engaged with the enemy. And you were brave. You were a brave soldier. He goes, that's not it. That's not it. And he goes, well, what is it? He goes, do you know what I am? I said, yeah, you're a spec for the United States Army. Got turned gunner. He says, no, sir. 
says, when I go home, I'm an assistant manager at a fast food restaurant. Mm. But here, here in the army, I am helping all these Iraqis reclaim this country for themselves. And that just took me out. And I said, you know what? If I can devote my life to taking care of people like you who are here for the right reasons. So it doesn't matter what the generals think or the politicians think. It really matters what this kid thinks Mm -hmm. and why he's there. He's not a rapist. He's not a pillager. He's not going to do bad. He is there because he thinks he's doing something noble and good. And he wants to stay in spite of a a, really a, a horrific experience because he wants to do something noble and good. He's the best of America. He is the GI of World War II that liberated Auschwitz and Dachau. He's, he's the guy that, that beat the Nazis to the ground and then gave the Germans back their country, right? He wasn't an occupier. Mm-hmm. He, and, and he's the best of what, what we envision Americans are. And in fact, Ira, I would say he is you and your, and your listeners. Because if you, Ira, were sent to a war, you'd be doing it for the same reasons this kid is doing it. Not because of what a politician thinks or anybody else, but you would be there doing exactly what he is. And then I get to take care of him. I get to take care of him and his buddies. I get to take care of them so they can go back and do this noble thing that they're doing. And any way that we can create an ecosystem that supports this kind of American, as opposed to the kind that try to take over the capital, then this is what life is about. And this gives you meaning. This gives you real meaning. And so that's that. So when I tell when your viewers and your listeners ask why you end up doing something, you don't set out to do it. But life takes you on this remarkable river driven journey. And when I came across that, that was galvanizing to me. That was the galvanizing moment, that young kid and and just the way he was. Wonderful story. Wonderful story. Really appreciate that intro. Uh, Jeff, let's talk about um, another wounded soldier because, uh, you know, as I'm reading about um, on-demand pharmaceuticals and and the the pharmacy on-demand machine, which we'll get into in a bit, um, this idea didn't start, uh, you know, locally. Uh, It started with you in a combat hospital in Afghanistan, I guess, taking care of another wounded soldier uh, looking for a medicine, which you didn't have. And it wasn't available in Afghanistan. I think you had a a flown in from from Germany or something uh, days later. Uh, Talk a little bit about, and this is another river that didn't go the way you thought it was going to go, but talk about this event and how it sort of started this idea, which ultimately, you know, went from Afghanistan to Germany to MIT to DARPA. Take us on a little bit of that uh, journey. Absolutely. So it comes back to this theme that I've started with, and that is, so I was in 2003, I was serving with the 452nd Combat Support Hospital in, um, in Afghanistan. We were the only combat uh, support hospital in Afghanistan at the time. We were the, so we were a trauma center, basically. So um, uh, a young American came to me. He was, uh, he was injured, um, and he suffered from something called dysautonomia. And that's a situation where you have a severe injury and your blood pressure and your heart rate are, go crazy, and it's very hard to manage. Mm-hmm. And so what it meant was, is that I had to leave him in, in, at, with us with the 452nd cash to manage him. Now, this is significant because the 452nd at that time, in 2003, was nothing more than a tent hospital. So we had very limited anything. You can imagine our job was to stabilize patients and turn them around and get them back to a long stool where the army has a big, uh, big hospital so they can get definitive care. So we were like patch them up, get them on an airplane. The trouble is that flight is about 20 hours long. It's not a, it's not a short flight. It's a very long flight to go from Afghanistan to uh, Ramstein Air Base in Germany. Mm-hmm. A long flight. You, you can't, uh, it, it's just a long flight. We'll just say it's 20 hours long. This kid not, would not have survived that flight because you know the, 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 the folks on the uh, uh, combat casualty air evacuation teams, the CCAT teams, didn't have, they had less than what we had. And the manager kid was blood pressure was going wild. It's just, he would have suffered a, 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 a just a, a disastrous outcome. So I left them there, but I needed, really, I, I knew what I needed. I needed a drug called bromocryptine. It's an old drug, it's a generic mm-hmm. drug. And, um, but of course we didn't have it. I mean, what we had was we had a, a connex full of drugs, 
but why would they have bromocryptine in it? And bromocryptine in here in the United States, I could go into a CVS or a Walmart or any place and bought the thing for just a couple of bucks a box. It's pretty cheap, you know, and and I'm sitting there going like, geez, doggone it, you know, it's like for want of a nail, right? I mean, here I am. I mean, I can stabilize the skill with this drug. I don't have it, so I'm doing what I'm doing. So I call the Air Force, and the Air Force goes, no problem. We'll get some to the air base in Ramstein, and we'll fly it to you. And they did. They flew it to me. It took a couple of days to get there, as you can imagine. Uh, they stuck it in the pocket of a jet jock. He flew it over. And I did have my bromocryptine, stabilized the kid, and he went home. And by the way, the happy ending of the story is that the kid did very well, finished out his time in the service. And from what I understand from his wife is that um, uh, he is now um, a veterinarian. So, nice. so that, that's awesome. He, so he went from near death to becoming a veterinarian, which is like way awesome. But awesome. that one box of bromocryptine, first of all, was late in coming to me. And second, it must have cost about 50 gazillion dollars in just gasoline alone for flying from a jet <laughs> airplane, right? So, and I, while I'm sitting there um, in, the, in the cash, you know, mulling about this, it, it came to me, I said, you know, doggone it, if I had a chemistry set and the right chemicals, I could make my own bromocryptine because bromocryptine is a fairly straightforward uh, small molecule. And, you know, I am a Cornell trained pharmacologist, medicinal chemist. And so, I, you know, but I just, if I had a chemistry set, if I had a chemistry set, I could make my own medicines. Then it occurred to me that bromocryptine is, is, uh, is like many other small molecules. The small molecules are things like um, ibuprofen and penicillin and, and things like that. Um, they're not uh, monoclonal antibodies like we're using for COVID, right? Sure. Or they're not vaccines that we're using for COVID, but they're small itty bitty uh, chemicals that are put together. But mm -hmm. they're put together, they're organic chemicals, which means that they have three constitutive components, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So in theory, I don't need a whole big monstrous chemistry set. I just need a good carbon source, oxygen source, hydrogen source, which is really like a pencil and a glass of water. And, you know, so maybe it's a little bit of sulfur, maybe a little fluoride for some of the other more exotics and an egg. So if I had a glass of water, a pencil and an egg, I should be able to make whatever I want. <laughs> now that's simplifying it a bit, but you get the idea. Sure. So then if in fact, I only need basically a few starting materials, and I had a really good chemistry set, I could make a whole bunch of stuff, including chemo agents, right? Yeah. And that came to my idea of, oh my gosh, why don't we create a machine that does all the mixing and stirring and heating that we would do in a, in a chem lab, starting with some starting materials, and then make whatever we want at the back end. So if I were then in the army hospital of the future, I would have this machine, and instead of a whole connex full of drugs that I may never use, I just have these handful of chemical sources, plug them into my machine, push a button, let stir and grind, all yada yada, and out would pop my medicine that I want. If it's bromocryptine, boom. If it's uh, penicillin, boom. If it is a painkiller like ibuprofen, boom. And that was the idea. So when I came home, I had this idea in my head, and I was fortunate enough to be assigned the uh, to DARPA, and that was one of my programs. I created a program to create that machine, and that took me to, um, to, to some of my friends uh, who were capable of doing such a thing. Of course, my friends happened to be Klaus Jensen, Tim Jamison, Alan Meyerson, all three are professors at MIT, mm -hmm. so they're not a bunch of dummies. I mean, they're actually really smart guys. I mean, Klaus at the time was the chair of chemical engineering, and Tim was the chair of chemistry, not too bad guys to know for doing something like this. And Alan, of course, well-versed, Dr. Meyerson, well-versed in how to do this sort of thing. I put those three uh, geniuses together and boom, out came the first iteration of this machine. And so this machine, it's about the size of a household refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And it does exactly what I said. I mean, it looks like a household refrigerator, actually. And, then, and you plug in a, a, some raw chemicals at the bottom. And by the way, raw chemicals never expire. When was the last time your table salt expired, right? I think it was a time of before Christianity when they were like getting it out of, the, out of the Dead Sea. So when you have stuff that never expires, that's an awesome thing. And then you have this machine that basically is like an easy bake oven. I date myself, Ira. You were probably too young to even remember. No, easy I remember bake easy bake oven. <laughs> stop, stop. Yeah. So easy bake oven. And boom, out pops your medicines. And in fact, right now we've demonstrated we can make 19 different medicines using this one machine. And so, and that has really kind of changed things. And my goal always still is to put it on a combat support hospital, mm -hmm. to put it on a aircraft carrier. 
to put it on the comfort or the mercy, which are the hospital ships, you know, to put it with the Marines and so on and so forth. Put it in that CCAT team, that that airplane that was flying, that flying hospital. You know, that to me is where I'd like to see my machine because then they can treat anything that comes up rather than have to presuppose what it is in stockpile and yada, yada, yada. Ultimately, my dream is it's a machine. It's a small, compact machine. Uh, it runs off of household current. If I slap a solar power source to it yep. and maybe a distiller you know, to clean water next to it, why can't I put it in a West African village? Yep. Why can't I put it in a village in Amazon? Why can't I put it in the jungles of the Philippines taking care of um, indigenous folks? Why not? And there's no reason why not. Right. And then they, they can make their own antibiotics, for example, or their own painkillers or what the heck have you. And so in my mind, what it does is it's democratizing this. So rather than have big manufacturers, you know, making boxes of stuff and selling hither, hither and yon, why not let each of these groups make the medicines for themselves? It's this whole concept of teaching a man to fish versus giving him a fish. Right. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I think it would be very empowering and very democratizing. If you had a machine and I had a machine and I decided to do something like that crazy hedge fund guy wanted to do with that drug, remember that HIV drug, Martin, yeah, yeah. whatever, and, you know, jack the price up. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if he decided to do that, you would say, hey, you can't do that, Martin. You know why? I got a machine of my own and I'm not going to sell it for $750 a pill. By the way, it still costs $750 a pill. I'm going to sell it for a dollar a pill. And then Jeff says, oh, Ira, I'm going to sell for 99 cents a pill. And Ira is the even trust. No, 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 no. I'm going to sell for 98%. And we would drive it down to where it is the appropriate price as opposed to you know, the lowest tolerable price rather than the maximally tolerable price. That in my head is how democratizing the ability for a Walmart or a mm -hmm. CVS or a hospital make their own medicines. And that's how I see this playing out in in the overall scheme, they drive the cost of medicine down, increase the supply of medicines to where they don't exist right now, empower people to make their communities to make their own medicines so they don't have to worry about like the big hospital chains, like during COVID-19, the big hospital chains are gobbling up all of the supply of drugs uh, for their patients and the little guy doesn't have that buying power and is screwed. Heck with that, make your own, make your own. When you have that level of independence, even more so than my, my, my military friends, you have the, the ability then to provide care at the highest level, but at the lowest cost. That's what I see. Wonderful, wonderful story. Um, and I like, you know, when you, when you go into the site and we'll, we'll put the links on there, uh, you know, there's this nice uh, pathway where you sort of talk about the machine as you were mentioning with the, the 19 or so critical medicines that you've already produced. Uh, you can make one now, you, you're going to, it's going to diversify the machines, you can make multiple. Um, are there, uh, it's a multiple part question, uh, you know, you mentioned the bromocryptine and, uh, and things like antibiotics, um, it sort of targets drugs that you're uh, excited about, um, it's sort of in the next phase. I also noticed that uh, in the, sort of the future vision one, but I don't know how much of the future, I mean, it's more, more or less now, you know, you mentioned things like, uh, uh, count, you know, the topic of countermeasures, uh, which the military is much more concerned about uh, in terms of chemical warfare and stuff like that. Uh, once again, this is a, a hot area uh, in, in, in the military domain, and obviously now in, in terms of pandemics. Um, count, important countermeasure projects uh, that you can talk about if you, if you can. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, third part, sorry for this long question, but uh, you may, you're a pharmacologist, but you, you're really a medicinal chemist also. Um, other chemicals that may not be drugs, but potentially uh, other things that can pop out of this machine that may be useful for that village in the Philippines or Indonesia or wherever that, once again, future thinking, but take us on a little journey. No, no, exactly. So thank you for that. It is an automatic chemistry set. So it means that it makes chemicals. The chemicals we're interested in right now are medicinals. Yep. But you are correct. Are there other chemicals such as nutraceuticals and things like that that can be made? Yep. Uh, food supplementations, vitamins yep. themselves. If you take a look at a vitamin, niacin, the B1 complexes, the B3 complexes, niacin, the B3, thiamine is, uh, is B1. You know, Can yep. it make vitamins? Of course it can make vitamins. It's like, they're chemicals. You can do yep. that. What the machine can't do, let's talk about that for a minute. 
are large complex proteins that sure. they can't do. Now those are chemicals, but uh, this machine would not be an efficient way to make those. So things like insulin, okay? Mm -hmm. um, things like, um, as we said before, vaccines, those have to be made a completely different way. So I want sure. to be clear on that. Um, so what I'm very excited about is the, uh, what, the, the, what the machine can do. And that is, I'll give you an example. Right now we know from our experience in March and April in New York City, as well as our experience now in Southern California, is that there is a, a pressure on certain medicines in particular, uh, those that are used in the ICU, all right, for patients who are on ventilators. So you need sedatives, you need paralytics, you need analgesics. Those are getting harder to come by. I'm not gonna say they're not easy to come, they're not impossible to come by, but they're harder to come by, let's put it that way, all right? And, um, and so what we did was we scaled up so that we can make uh, some of these, these medicines, uh, a medicine called propofol, which is an anesthetic, sure. Uh, another drug called cisatricurium, which is a paralytic, and, and so on and on. And then you would say, well, one of your little machines, Jeff, how much does it make? Well, I'll give you an example. Our little machine can make the entire nation's supply. Can, no, let me rephrase that. Our one machine, one of our machines can meet the entire nation's demand of cisatricurium mm. a day. We can right. meet it a day. One machine, not, not a thousand, a single machine can make... We can meet the nation's supply of Nimbex a day. We can make probably half the nation's supply of certain analgesics a day, one machine. And so it gives you an idea of what we're trying to do. We're trying to increase the, the throughput and capacity. Now you say, well, why would you need to do that? It's because it means that if you, I were running, say, LA County Hospital and you need a drug, that if you need a Nimbex, you would only spend 15 minutes making Nimbex. And then you turn it off because if you can make the nation supply in a day, you at LA County probably only need 15 minutes worth. So you flip it on, make 15 minutes worth, and then you have the machine make another drug for you and another drug for you and another drug. So that's the point that I'm trying to make, that the, our machine is very rapidly reconfigurable to another drug. And because we make such a high volume of a given drug, you don't have to run it for 24 hours to make what you need. You, 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 know, you don't need one machine for every drug. You just need one machine. Boom. End of story. And which, when it's fully automated, and why is that important? Quality, quality. Because one of the things that we don't pay a lot of attention to is the quality of our medicines. FDA does, but if you think about it, uh, that has become a big issue, right? The quality of the medicines that each person takes. In fact, there is a thought that sometimes the failure of a medicine to, let's say, abort the cancer or a failure of the medicine to stop the infection may not be because the medicine isn't effective. It may be because you got a crappy batch of that medicine. Because the way it's made now, it's made in big batches, kind of like the way you make beer. And the when, when, and when it's, uh, and it's not made in this country by and large, because you know it's made in China and India. And we have, an FDA has no authority over the Chinese and the Indians. I wanna be clear on this. The yeah. FDA has no authority. So when they send it over, you take maybe one package out of this Connex rule and you test it and say, oh, it's good or it's not good. And there you go. And if you take a look at it, we have no control over the quality of our medicines. The nice thing about this machine is we know at every single step what's being made. And so we have 65 online analytical measures, including Raman spectroscopy and other kind of fancy things. But what it allows is it allows FDA, it allows you, the hospital pharmacist, to go online and say, I just got a batch of uh, drugs from on-demand pharmaceuticals. Uh, or I just got a batch of drugs came off of my on-demand pharmaceutical machine. How do I know it's good? And you just push a button and all of a sudden all this analytic data comes up that you know that this pill, this is pill 133 that came off of my machine this morning. What is its chemical characteristics? And you look at it and it goes, oh, it's perfect, mm -hmm. right? And oh, it's not. What the hell's wrong with this machine? The machine will have shut itself off if that were the case. That's why we do it. But, uh, but we make this level of transparency to you and the FDA and everybody else that you know not the quality of a particular sample package out of a Connex, but you know the quality of every single pill that comes off the machine. That changes the level of assurance to uh, patients that they are get and providers that they're both giving and getting exactly what they intend to do. And that adds a new level of, of, of things on. So that's another thing we're happy about. But you asked a really good question. If they had this automatic chemistry set, 
What else could a village in an Amazonia make? Anything. Anything. It's a matter of how we program it and some other stuff. But the fact is, in my mind, um, it's like a hammer, right? A hammer is a wonderful tool. You can use it to build beautiful furniture, correct? Sure. But if in the hands of a Michelangelo, he creates <laughs> extraordinary art. And if I put it in the hands of an orthopedic surgeon, he replace, she replaces a knee. But yet it's still a hammer, correct? And so there are a lot of things that the fact that you would have an automatic chemistry set that you could apply it to for beneficence that goes beyond the level of just medicinals. And we just touched on a few, but you can imagine many, many others. What the value of being able to make proper chemicals, fertilizers, for example, and things, things like that. But of course, you have to put safeguards in these things. Sure. That, that's totally within the power of, of, of capability these days. But at the end of the day, it's what can we give to somebody that will find a use for it? Yeah. And that's empowerment. Absolutely. What you and I are talking about is empowerment. Absolutely. You know, Jeff, um, as a background, and I haven't practiced, I'm a pharmacist by undergraduate training. Uh, I practiced community pharmacy for many years. I don't like going in the pharmacy. <laughs> so, don't like doing it. Uh, obviously, this is down the road, but, you know, for the, uh, you know, most of what we take in our life, for my three kids, it's a generic antibiotics, and I take my generic blood pressure pill, and my wife take whatever she takes, but... um. Any dream visions for 15 years down the road where I may have my little uh, kit, uh, my, I'm sorry, my little uh, home version of the POD where, you know, I'm sorry, CVS, but can we take the pharmacy out of the, the loop in certain areas where, you know, uh, it's it's snowing out. I don't want to go pick up my antibiotic. I can make it. <laughs> my yeah, a absolutely. I mean, you could, you could see, that. I mean, right now we've reduced the size of the original pod machine to yeah. the size of a of a uh, household refrigerator. It's not the size of a dorm refrigerator, actually. So we've actually shrinking it down. So could it ever get to the point where it could go into somebody's home? So there's nothing technological preventing that, mm -hmm. all right? However, I would say this though, before I did that though, the, what I see is the pharmacist, the traditional pharmacist is going back to his and her roots. Yeah. Remember the original pharmacist was an apothecary. Yeah. And the apothecary, and the training of a pharmacist, by the way, also includes apothecary, is that they basically made the medicines. Yep. You would go to your apothecary, they, that, that, that pharmacist would make your medicines for you. Herb exactly. Right a mortar and a pestle. That's what their symbol is, right? And, and I see coming back to that. Why? Because the medicines we have, it, the, yes, you can put a medicine in somebody's hands, but to take it properly, to understand it, does require a professional having... Uh, some level of um, what I would like to say is oversight. And the pharmacist, I think by really, uh, uh, alleviating them of just stocking shelves, which some pharmacists end up doing, which is a total waste of their incredible training, four years of training, six of your PharmD, mm -hmm. um, is that now they go back to their roots. I mean, they go back to making the appropriate medicine for the appropriate patient. Because remember, you can make every pill, Yep. If a person comes in with a different body size than another one, you, you could tweak it. You could say, oh, sir, I mean, you should be getting 365 milligrams and you, ma'am, should be getting 315 milligrams. You could tweak it. And that is putting it back into the control that has personalized medicine. So I believe that the pharmacist's role is going to change, but I believe it's going to change back to what their roots were, you know, and, and that's my belief. As far as having a machine in every uh, um, uh, house, absolutely. Why not? Why not? Mm -hmm. uh, but but still, it would uh, I, I would be a little bit more than just going up and pushing the button. Out comes a pill. I think sure. it'd be programmed by your pharmacist in conjunction with your provider, so that it's truly personalized. That in fact, if you are a very large person, you you know that your dose would be tweaked. Mm -hmm. Or if you are on a higher, and you know how it goes, if you have a, so for some reason you're in a higher dose, of, let's say an anti-epileptic. It will be tweaked. And the, so that all of you, the consumer, have to do is push the green button, beep, and then out it spits into your hand. So you don't have to get online, you know, in a snowstorm to CVS wearing a mask six feet apart from the next guy. And I think that that's the, the direction we're taking. Again, it is uh, by putting convenience in the hands of patients, I believe will also improve compliance. Mm -hmm. And this is a, and as, a, as a trained pharmacist, you know, that's the biggest bugaboo. 
It's oh, compliance. Yeah. And anything that we can do is reduce those barriers to care. But I would want to see these for now, in my mind, I like to see it in the, in, the, in the places where people are having a hard time getting their own medicines, right? Where they can't get right. to the Walmart and the CVS and the, uh, and the Rite Aid. And that's, to me, uh, where we want to go first. Sure. Foremost. And I start with the military because that's the most obvious. Sure, sure. Really fascinating. Um, Jeff, I wanted to say, going along those lines, um, obviously, you know, aside from everything that you have done, everything you're doing, you, uh, I mentioned earlier, you were the founding um, director of, of the Biologic Technologies Office at DARPA. We I, I had the honor of speaking to some, I guess, your previous employees, uh, Alamondi and uh, Eric Van Giesen, working in different Old components. friends. Yep. Old I, friends. Yeah. Yep. I hired, I hired Van Giesen. Yep. <laughs> I did not Goodness. hire Al. I wish I had. I would have liked to have that feather in my cap too. Yeah. But uh, but good guys. Yes, absolutely. All, all amazing folks. I'm always amazed by um, sort of the DARPA model and sort of all of these moonshots that uh, you guys can work on. And and uh, you know I know you don't get to stay there for very you know longer than five years, but you, you do get to 12. work on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no no no, because they kept kicking me up to middle management. <laughs> <laughs> One of the um, one of things I wanted to ask you. I know this is separate from uh, pharmacy on demand, but nonetheless, I, while I have you, um, I've seen a lot in recent months on um, different groups that want to translate the DARPA model to the private sector uh, because you guys did so much and you were so efficient. Um, I'm just very interested in your views on. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's possible, but. Uh, how that DARPA model can be translated to other areas of uh, research uh, to make what goes on out here, let's say in universities or private research institutions more efficient uh, because you guys were so <laughs> amazingly efficient uh, and on the bleeding edge of everything. I'd just like to get a few minutes, your thoughts about some of these groups that are trying to create uh, DARPA in the, uh, the non-military world. Sure, DARPA. So you should know that I've been trying to launch a agency called HARPA uh, okay. for health, right? Because DARPA is focused, even though we're talking about health issues, Ira, DARPA really is a defense agency. Yeah. That's what it is. It's, it's a military agency. I mean, their, their primary job is to ensure the nation's security. So the vast majority of what they do has to do with defense. They do a little bit. You talk to Eric, you talk to Al, you know, talk to me. We're very focused on health. But that's a teeny, itty bitty part of it. But yeah. we both know that the health needs of our society is humongous, right? I mean, just take a look at COVID-19. It's, it's, it, it just tells you ahead of time, right? Yeah. Uh, let me point out that, by the way, I'm happy the BTO through Dan Wattendorf were the first ones to invest in Moderna 10 years ago. Nice. Uh, that, that we, you asked uh, this whole idea of an RNA vaccine. Uh, who first funded it? DARPA. Yep. You can ask the Moderna guys, and they'll tell you Dan Wattendorf was a program manager at DARPA. He's the guy who gave them their first dollars when they're just a couple of guys with a good idea. And that he's comes at the, back he's to at the Gates Foundation, right? Uh, yeah, right. Okay, so, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, so uh, Dan is now at the Gates Foundation. Okay. So, so this is how it usually works, like the self-driving car. Oh, Google did it. No, DARPA did it. Right, but right, then right. Google hired the entire <laughs> DARPA team, so they all work for Google now. So, hey, that's the way it works. But let's come back to DARPA. And you, you asked me a really good question. And I'll tell you, it's not a secret. What's hard is in the execution, and I'll end with that, all right? The hard part is the execution of creating a DARPA-like model anywhere, in government, out of government, anywhere. And I'll, I'll explain to you in a minute. But let's talk about the DARPA model. The DARPA model is actually very simple. The DARPA mission statement is to maintain U.S. technological superiority. That's it. That's it. And so when you, when you listen to that statement, it sounds so simple, but there's a lot of depth to it. Sure. And it comes back to this. The way I interpret it is that what sets DARPA aside, first and foremost, is its philosophy. All right? And the philosophy is this, is that you do science to create a capability. Arthur Prabhakar, our former DARPA director, articulated this eloquently. You do science to create a capability. You start off not with, I'm going to do science to do science, or I'm going to do science to understand. No, I'm going to do science to 
to create a capability. And along the way, you'll do all those other things, but you always keep your eye on the mark. I'm going to, you know, put up, I want a satellite that will let me know where I am in, 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 in the entire world. It will be a beacon, right? It will be the waypoint for my compass. Of course, that's GPS. And that's what was back in 63. Or I want a machine that could talk to other machines. Of course, that was internet. But it was to build a capability. So up front, you have to articulate not what your, your tech is or your science is, but what are you trying to accomplish? What, do you, what problem are you trying to solve? We call him the Hahnemeyer Catechism for uh, Dr. Hahnemeyer, who was a DARPA director back in the day. He created this catechism or these series of questions are online that, that you as a program manager must answer if you want your program to move forward. And first and foremost is, what problem are you trying to solve? That's really key. So whatever you do, it's got to create a capability. That's number one. Number two is, which and this part I really like, is I call it the cool factor. Is it cool? Is what you're trying to do cool? Because if it's not cool, then why the heck are you doing it? So if somebody comes up and says, and I, this is one of my favorites. Somebody, and, th and this is, of course, lore, but the one program manager one day came up and said, I'm going to invent an invisible jet fighter. And everybody's like, go, you know, most people will say, you're out of your freaking mind, right? But this program manager literally said, I'm going to invent a jet fighter. And the first question the leadership asked wasn't, are you out of your mind, was, is that cool? Now, who doesn't think an invisible jet fighter isn't cool? I'd like one. You'd like one. Right? James Bond wants one. Wonder what Wonder Woman had one. Wonder Woman has one, right? So why don't we, right? Hey. So, so the answer was, it is cool. I passed the cool factor. So what exactly are you – now let's ask the second question, which is what's the science behind it that you're going to do? Is this going to be – and what he meant was he says, look, if you were a jet fighter and you were invisible to the naked eye, that means the guy on the, the, per, the bad person on the ground looking up wouldn't see you. But even if he saw you, it was too late anyway because if you're a jet fighter, you're moving about 400 miles, you know, four or 500 miles an hour while you're in close attack, and he's already dropping a bomb on top of your head anyway. Where you want to be invisible is 300 miles away, where they don't see you coming. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was talking about stealth, right? right? And when you put it in that context, you realize he created an invisible jet fighter on radar, and that's what mattered. And that in itself was already cool. But it, it, so you, you contextualize it. So when somebody comes up and says, I've got this great thing, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cure let's say, uh, liver cancer. Mm -hmm. You and I would say, that's cool. That's cool. You're going to, you're going to, you know, or as opposed to, I've come up with a better way to make lips plumper. That may be, but I don't really care. And it's not cool to me. Right. So if you're going to come up with a way to cure liver cancer, that's cool. Or let's better, still better. Let's say this. I come up with a way to cure pancreatic cancer. That would be big. You would say that would be cool. And that would be big. And, and before you threw the bum out for being an idiot, because you know, all the, all the big honchos haven't figured it out yet. You could, come on in. Let me hear it. You know, because right. DARPA is different. And, and that's another, that's another element of DARPA. DARPA looks for a way to say yes. Everybody else looks for a way to say no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not this. It's not that. You pick it until it bleeds. Whereas where we at DARPA was, no, if it is cool and it is a capability, then let's find a way to say yes. So you are coming to me and say, I've got a way to cure pancreatic cancer. Before I dismiss you because you're not a, a, a famous professor of X at, at an Ivy League university, you're just Ira. But Ira probably has a good idea. I need to hear it out. So DARPA, we always had that attitude. Find a way to say yes if it meets those first two things. Now, that you may not be able to find a way to say yes. Got it. But if there is a way to say yes, you go to, you do it, and this is the way you do it. You go, Ira, that's a great idea. But, and you say, well, I need $10 million to do it. I said, you know, Ira, I'm not going to give you $10 million to do it. I'm going to give you $500,000, and you show me if you can get to ba first base. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to build this thing that's going to cure pancreatic cancer, what's the first thing that you got to accomplish? What's the very first thing? Well, I got I to gotta show that I can actually make this molecule. Good. Here's 500K. You make that molecule, and then you come back and talk to me. And so what that meant was that DARPA doesn't give a grant. It gives a contract to do work at a certain – to milestones that lead clearly to your goal, and we both agree on it, and on a timeline that meets that goal. 
Because you'll say to me, if you are a typical academic scientist, you're thinking about funding, sustaining your lab, paying for your grasses, blah, 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 right? And, but I'm saying to you, it's like, no, 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 forget all that junk. You are trying to cure pancreatic cancer. Alex Trebek is a classic example of what happens when you wait too long. Yep. So there are other Alex Trebeks out there who are waiting for you to get done. And I will promise you, if your mother had pancreatic cancer and you thought you could solve it, you'd be working night and day. And so how do I enable you to work night and day? I will give you money. I will give you money to buy higher graduate students, postdocs, you know, collaborators, anything. But what I'm not going to give you is time. You're not going to get four years of a gift. Yeah. You're going to get two years and you're going to show me that you're hitting these milestones at the time. Because if you're not, what DARPA will do is take your money away. And that is a tremendous incentive. And that is something that's an anathema to many other places for obvious reasons. But if you're trying to create a capability that's cool, that makes a difference, time is a very expensive commodity. And you can defeat time by giving other things that will speed the process along. Because the goal at the end is to create the capability, not to sustain the enterprise. And so DARPA doesn't give grants. DARPA gives contracts. contracts. And that and with milestones and timelines that have to be met. Now look, you Ira, because you're trying to cure cancer, let's be clear on this. You may say, oh my God, I was trying to get the milestone three. It's turning out harder than I than I anticipated. You're gonna take my money away. I'm not a moron. I want you to succeed. I want to, I want to cure pancreatic cancer. I'm going to come over and say, let's see what you got going on, Ira. And you are showing me that, no, it's not because I went to the Bahamas and spent like the last six months over there twiddling my thumbs. I was hard at work in the lab and I've got these problems here, blah, blah. If I were smart, and DARPA tries to do this, I'll give you additional funding. Ira, I got it. You got to get past this muscle. Here's another half a million dollars higher the, you know, Professor X to help you with this so you can get past this and we can get this cure. Because at the end of the day, it's not to see you fail, it's to see you succeed. Absolutely. We want you to succeed. But notice, and so that's another thing that goes with DARPA, that they're willing to give more money if you are showing due diligence and it looks like you're going to succeed because the goal is to succeed. My robotic arm project Instead yeah. of four years, they went to five years, but doggone it, they succeeded. Nobody remembers that we gave them additional funding for the fifth year. We just remember the daggone thing succeeded because that's the ultimate goal. And then we come back to this, which I think is really super important, and why the biggest fail point is DARPA program managers like Al and Eric, they have control over the dollars they get. So when they pitch a program and we say, you know what, Eric, that's a, that's a genius idea. Here is... $30 million are putting it against your line so you can go and spend it. It's suddenly now under his line. He literally can say, all right, you four guys, you're going to all split this $40 million and you're going to go to work. You find two of the guys are banging it, banging it. You find one woman who's killing it and you find one knucklehead who's not keeping pace. <laughs> so you're able to go in. Eric is able to go in with just probably permission from his office director like me and say, hey, you know, Jeff, I, want, I need to get this knucklehead's money away and give it to this lady who's killing it. So I said, do it. We don't have to ask anybody's permission. He just literally takes the money out from one, uh, one pile, puts it against her line, and, and it's go, 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 go. It is that flexibility and independence that you will see no place else in the government. No place else. I mean, a PM, even an office director, does not have signatory power over dollars other than that dark and that's how we get rid of bureaucracy. And then you would say, well, what happens if Eric was really a sleazebag and tried to steal the money and blah, blah, blah? Because that's what people ask, right? And I said, then I hired the wrong guy. It's my fault. It's Jeff's fault as the office director. I hired the wrong guy. I'm the idiot. Because my job is to make sure that Eric is a true public servant. And Eric really is working on the taxpayer's behalf. Otherwise, I'm at fault. And so the safeguard from preventing malfeasance is really my responsibility. And that's where it should be anyway, right? And so here you have Eric, who I trust to do the people's work, to come up with a cure for pancreatic cancer. He will work with his scientists to create that. He will enable them. But we've gotten rid of all the typical crazy oversight over the what ifs. That level of trust in public servants that level of trust exists in few other places. Military has it. Military has it. Um, but the, uh, you know, you look at special operators, they go out and they, you know, with bags of money and to, to get stuff done and they get it done. 
Same thing here. I mean, you're giving $30 million against the line to a guy like Dr. Eric Van Giesen. I think it's money well, it's in good hands. And you have to believe that. So that's where the problem is. You have to, one, have a philosophy of, is it cool? And to say yes. That's hard to do. Second, you have to be able to allow the person in charge to have the flexibility to move the money around. And that's really it. It's moving the money around, right? And that is an anathema to a lot of people. A lot of, a lot of bosses get, real, what, 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 I got to have control of the dollars. Yeah. You know, and once you do that, now there's a line that's, that's, that is 20 people deep outside your door every damn day. You can't do that. You can't be nimble. Therein is the, is the, is, is the driver. And then to have your performers perform to a timeline and a milestone. Those are the secrets. Those are the, very simple. But as you know, Ira, getting folks to execute against that model yep. is really hard. Yep. Really hard. Now, if you could recreate that uh, in the real world, I think we'd. <laughs> There's something else I want to add and one more comment. Please, after this. please. And that is, it's a special thing in the United States. You say, well, why doesn't DARPA exist in other, other places? Like, why doesn't North Korea have it? Or why doesn't China have it? You know what I mean? You know, Japan has a, a smaller version of it. So does England. But, but other than that, why not? Because you have to allow that DARPA program manager to think and to imagine mm -hmm. without constraint. It's the only way that this is going to work. And if you're in a totalitarian government, you cannot have a group of highly educated, highly skilled individuals thinking without constraint. Because mm -hmm. now you, you got trouble. So they'll never create this, ever. Because it will threaten their, the, 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 their, their totalitarian government. Whereas here in the United States, we embrace it. Yep. We embrace it. I mean, you know, the fact that you can even have a, a show like you do, Ira, would not be allowed in many places because you have all these free thinkers and you're a free thinker. And the whole idea is that but in this society that we have, and, and some of the other ones I just mentioned, um, they too share that. And that is what makes progress go forward. Progress progresses because people are allowed to imagine, allowed to innovate. And I don't mean just in science, I mean in everything, right? Sure. And, and you have to have that if, you, if society is going to continue to grow. And, um, and when you don't have that, uh, that tolerance of free thought, free expression, free speech, which is all the things that go into this, you can't, you'll never create a DARPA. You'll never create these breakthrough technologies. It just can't happen. Mm -hmm. You have to steal them. That's the only way you're going to get them. Uh, we see too much of that, unfortunately. Right. And, but that's not a sustainable model. We know that. No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, Jeff, it's, uh, it's very inspiring stuff. Um, I'm really wishing you the best with this. And uh, I mean, obviously, you, you got a great head on your shoulders. You know what you're doing here. And uh, this, uh, to see this model, uh, you know, not just what you're creating today, but this, the future of it uh, is, is just fascinating. And I, once again, uh, the best of luck with this moving forward. Um, for everybody uh, that's going to be listening to this episode uh, or watching on the YouTube channel, you've been listening to the amazing uh, Colonel Dr. Jeffrey Ling, founder and chief executive officer of On Demand Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we'll put a link in the uh, in the bio, but uh, with a, a mission of providing adequate, safe, reliable supplies of critical medicines and potentially any other types of chemicals to every community across the world. Uh, Jeff, thank you for, for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, thank you for your service to the United States. I should have said that up front. Um, and, and thank you for what you're doing. And as we say, thank you for creating a better tomorrow for everyone. Uh, this is clearly doing that. It's uh, been an honor uh, spending time with you and listening to the story. Thank you, Ira. Thank you, everybody who listened. Really appreciate it. Absolutely.